Hello and welcome to the Bem Student. I'm your host Chetna Chauhan. This is our first episode and our guest on today's episode is my mentor, someone who I give a lot of credit for my own Bem skills. He's a very well-known name in Canadian AEC industry. Currently as a chief technology officer at Turner Fletcher Architects, he is continually pushing the boundaries in the company in digital innovation, automation and thought leadership. Prior to that, he has been fulfilling the roles that are technology focused at IBI Group and CH2M Hill for almost two decades. He's a licensed architect in the province of Ontario and Alberta, involved in major projects like London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games and Panama Canal widening. He has been dedicating his time and offering his expertise in Canada's BIM Council's Board of Directors as a board member since 2016. His passion focuses on life cycle BIM interoperability and cross-platform synergy. And if these were not enough feathers in his hat, he also shares his expertise as a faculty at George Brown College Toronto and at Gonquin College at Ottawa. He's also an avid runner and a fitness freak and an excellent human being. Please welcome Brent Maudi. Thank you so much for being here Brent. You have no idea how happy I am to be interviewing you. My pleasure. <laughs> so, do you want to start with like a quick introduction about your background? Like I know most of the people might know who you are, but let's just quickly get into how you actually stumbled on BIM and and everything. Sure, that. that sounds good. So I've been I'm a practicing architect and I've been in the industry for 20 years and dating back to school it was all about what can I do with technology to make things easier. And it caused a little bit of friction back then because we were still drawing on mylar and pencils and stuff. But once I got working and so my first firm was CH2M Hill and they realized that I liked to model and I like to experiment with information. So they said to me, "Brent, why don't you leave this 3D stuff?" And that's what it was called back then, the 3D stuff. And I said, "Sure." And back then we were working with Bentley tools, so MicroStation, EcoSim and all of those products, and we started, "What can we do with this with these models and what can we do with this information?" And then came the big one where they said, "You're working on a water treatment plant. You've got to connect all the process components to the operation screens." And I said, "Okay, hold on. This is pretty cool. How do we do that?" So we started with schematics and modeling and comparing the two, and schematics became the screen interface, and then how do you connect them from design through construction into that interface and operations? And that opened my mind to the possibilities. Then the BIM phrase was coined, and I thought, "Okay, that makes a lot of sense." And then I was assigned to the London Olympics, and I was the BIM lead for bringing a whole bunch of entities together and ensuring that their data can share and feed things like the geographic information system, the games planning, etc. and that was a mind-blowing experience for two and a half years and it propelled me to where I am today. Right now I'm the chief technology officer at Turner Fleischer and you know my my mandate is to weave technology into our daily practice to advance to research to keep us on the cutting edge of design and technology and to just make the practice of architecture better I mean there are so many things I can talk to you about because you started with something at CH2M Hill when they didn't even know what BIM is to actually take them through that journey and now you're a CTO and you were design technology director at IBI so i just want to discuss more about the role of leadership because you have started from the the base and you have been in the leadership you are the leadership now so i want to touch on something like mindset how do we talk to leaders uh, people who are the partners who are the senior associates who might want to get into bim but they don't have the right mindset they don't have the right expectations out of the process So I, I got a lot to say. So to the first statement is the role of leadership is critical, right? And if you think of them from the bottom up and the top down. So bottom up, I think a lot of people will understand there's software, there's goals, there's approaches. I always say what are you beaming? Why are you beaming it? How are you sharing all that good stuff? You need the or you need the people to be able to do that. 
but you need support of the partner, the leaders of the firm, the project managers. Those levels are very critical. And to gain their support, I learned in my career, bogging them down with techno babble will never ever help. So if I talk about BIM, I could talk about all of the life cycle possibilities from planning straight through to operations. Wonderful. But you've got to cater the message to show the owners and leaders and partners that there's a value to be brought with what they're doing today. And then there's value adds that allow them to expand. And I benefited profusely by this in all the places that I've worked. So back at CH2M Hill, it was, okay, this 3D modeling is increasing. What's it all about? And it was discovering from first principles, how does it benefit me as an architect, right? So this whole concept of we're automating things, people get afraid, oh, you're going to take away my jobs and stuff. Absolutely not. You're going to make things better. So as when I was an intern architect, becoming an architect, you know, the simplest example of, I don't ever for the rest of my life want to draw a door and plan and then go and draw it in the right place in elevation in the right place in suction, etc. So you have a 3D model, you put it once, it appears everywhere. Boom, I just automated that. Nobody can ever dispute that automating that draw it once instead of three times is not better. No, that cannot be disputed. Then all of a sudden you say, okay, understand data. So what do I do with that door as an architect? I've got to schedule it and add all of these these um, pieces of information. Is it rated? What's the hardware, etc.? I have to do that as an architect. Well, guess what? I can now suddenly automate it and schedules appear. I connect it to my spec and all these good things happen. So it makes my life better and more efficient. So once you tie the, a piece of the technology to the efficiency of the firm, again, whether it's doors or beams or conduits or ductwork, there's things that the applications can do that can achieve my goals that are complementary to what I already have to do. Then all of a sudden the door is open and you have this dialogue with a partner. No partner would say, I'd rather you take three times as long to draw the door. Nobody would say that. So you open the possibility for efficiency, effectiveness and value. And then all of a sudden it's like a snowball rolling down the hill. You just learn it, you become better and you learn it some more, but think of the snowball. So learn the piece first. Don't go into a project and say, hey, I watched the BIM podcast and I know I can do 200 things and I'm gonna do them all at once. No, no, if you decide on Revit, and notice how I said, if you decide on Revit, because you could pick any one of the six or 10 BIM authoring tools, Rafa, Archicad, Ecosim, uh, All Plan, Briscad, et cetera. So whatever you decide on, learn how to do what you do today more effectively, show the value, and then move onward, but get the buy-in and have the confidence of the leadership of your firm. And then that will brew confidence across the rest of the firm. With that said, one question I've been asked a lot because I do train a lot of individuals who want to learn Revit, uh, like Revit is my speciality, uh, who want to learn Revit. And um, they have started from, a, from where you've started or where even I have started from a drawing board, uh, from labeling things. Upgrading to AutoCAD is already a big jump to them. And then again, I'm talking about uh, small to medium sized companies where partners, they, they have more responsibility of getting the business rather than actually getting the documents done. So do you right. think it is, it is important for them to learn the software or they can get a hang of it and just know that what to expect out of the software? So one of a couple of phrases that I coined, and maybe you heard me say this before, BIM savvy, BIM aware, and BIM don't care. And that, I think I said that the first time 12 years ago, and it's stuck in my own head, which is great. I don't think partners or project managers or corporate leaders have to be BIM savvy, right? The main thing is that they're aware. And then equally, you've got to make sure that they are not in the BIM don't care. So when they don't care, they have blinders on, you hear the, we've been doing this for a hundred years, why do I have to change? If they're aware, that's the most important thing because it can inform how they bid, what they're bidding on, the type of partnerships or consortiums that are being built around projects, even selection of consultants. So if you think, well, I'm gonna BIM, but my structural or my MEP doesn't know BIM, well, think about that and think about the impact of that on a true integrated approach to design. Because 
if you step all the way back, architecture, structural, and MEP, using buildings as an example, have to relate. Site civil, piping, utilities have to relate. They have to coordinate their designs or you have disasters. So if we can better coordination, great. They can go and start to price projects and try to win work based on those concepts in mind. Be aware of what BIM makes easier. Be aware of the value. You don't have to be BIM savvy. You don't have to manipulate Revit. I, so in using Revit as the example, I believe people on the project or people connected to the project, it would be great for them to open the model in Revit Viewer so they can't break the model, interact, see the sheets and not have to wait for a set of PDFs or something like that. There's all value to that, but it's definitely not a foundational requirement to get them rolling. It's the awareness of the possibilities. So I haven't plugged my teaching so I'm a professor at both George Brown College and Algonquin College. And a lot of these foundational concepts, I teach to train BIM, potential BIM coordinators on how they can start to infuse the knowledge into wherever they end up working. They bring the skill, they're the savvy ones, but they help to build the awareness. And there's never, you can see I like to talk. There's never enough talking. You cannot over communicate the value and the possibilities. So the more awareness sessions that happen internal to large firms, medium firms and small firms, the better. And that's why this podcast, it's about awareness. It's about making people understand that there is value to be had. Purpose fit the value, scope the BIM process, make it apply for what you're doing and reap the benefits. Next, I want to touch on a very important, very sensitive, but a lot of times it's a deciding factor and that's the billability. Okay, let's take an example of a, a small firm where they would not have a, a, a person who's solely dedicated to, to doing BIM coordination. So everybody has to do their job. How important is it is that they are not accountable for uh, billability for that job? So I'm, I'm torn. I have two approaches that I think are beneficial. Uh, so in my career, I, I've tried to outline aspects of a BIM coordinator's role that are very clearly for the project and aspects that are not. So examples of that would be, I analyze clashes on my model. So clashes are very project specific. The model is about the project. And if I'm able to tell you, hey, your beam is going through your duct, the clash, we want to fix that. It's very project level. Uh, quantify my concrete. How many pounds of steel do I have? What's my count of beams? My surface area of wall panel? All about the project. But then you say, well, we need to make a Revit template. Obviously not project specific. Um, content is very unique where you say, I want to build this widget, but I want to have it able to apply not only for my project, but for multiple projects. So plugging Turner Fleischer, what we have internally is what's called the digital practice department. And it's all about governing, refining, and advancing the technologies to enhance the digital approach that can then weave and apply into all the projects. So their focus, I mentioned uh, content creation. We have a software developer. We have um, advanced BIM managers to lay the framework in place for what can be applied. But then equally, we do have project level charging. So if a project says, I need a BXP, great. You need a BIM execution plan. All projects should have that. So we have a template that's been done in overhead that we then take to the project and we add the project specific that should be project chargeable. Or if we, if, and then there's a question of, well, do you want to bill that to your client? That's at the discretion of the firm. So maybe you don't want the client to see an item that says, create my BIM plan. Fair enough. So you can weave it into the fee, but you want to be able to track the project level efforts as separate from the corporate or firm wide efforts. Same with content. We have content creators. They get a request. They build the content. They make it available through our service and it can then be applied by the modelers at the project level. But the BIM coordinators, that role, that project level BIM coordination is so critical. And that's where we want to make sure that we don't put blinders on and say we do BIM and then turn away and not look at it or cater it for the project. So maybe I don't need quantities, but maybe I need some clashes, but maybe just once a month. And then maybe we want to have somebody host a review session and drive people through it and track the issues. All of that is project coordination. It's all at the level of the project should be built to a project 
And then whether you charge the client or bury it or make it non-bill is the discretion of the management of the project and client relations and all of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I actually had so many questions, but I want to move to the last um, the last section that we have. And I always feel intimidated by by the guests. So just to make my intimidation a little low and my anxiety a little low, I ask them impossible questions, questions that I know of answers of, but I'm pretty sure or they don't know either all of them or they know very little of. So I'm going to start with those questions and uh, some of them might okay. also be BIM, BIM related. Uh, but first one is from the Ontario Building Code. And that's solely because I am reading Ontario Building Code very uh, closely these days. So in, in what condition uh, a building that is required to be of a non-combustible construction would allow a combustible fl uh, plumbing fixture to be added in? Oh my goodness. I don't know if I could answer that without actually opening up the code and doing my PDF search and finding. That's a, I, I, I cannot give you an answer to that <laughs> off the bat, top of okay, my head. Uh, okay, so it is, um, it is uh, that it needs a flame spread rating of 200 or less. Right. That's the answer. Okay. So if, so if, uh, awesome. uh, if a plumbing fixture has, uh, has a flame spread rating, of 200 or less and it's combustible you can put it in a building that is required to be non non combustible construction okay some some of these and that, words and that makes sense that makes sense okay now you worked with plants right the uh, water treatment plants yes so they are industrial yes. occupancy and they are a high hazard industrial occupancy not not always not oh. always so yeah, so we actually had a lot of effort. Uh, we wanted to mostly keep the plants at an F3, because obviously okay. F3 is the, the least uh, constraining, but they were always defined as post-disaster buildings. Okay. So there was always that condition, and that's, I, I can't remember where in the code, but that's a defined term, kicked in specific particulars about ratings that we always had to apply. So just imagine a big bowl of concrete holding a lot of water needed fire rating. I was like, what do you mean it's water water can't yes. burn right but there was a lot of re sometimes we had to challenge requirements for sprinklers in spaces that contained or were adjacent to water tanks so there's a lot of interesting things with a post-disaster builder okay okay but this one is specifically again coming from obc uh and it says that in, in industrial occupancy that has 50 employees and I'm a big supporter, yeah. and I know you are too, of uh, equality at workplace. So I'm going to put in that industrial occupancy, 25 men and 25 women. Okay. Yeah. How many water closets and lavatory we need for such a uh, industrial oh. occupancy? <laughs> Man, I would go to the chart and see, but it could be like um, four or five per sex, potentially. Uh, is that close? That's it's almost six. double. We just need two. We just need two. Just two. Each. Okay. And okay. then one okay. we need for and one we need for accessible. Correct. Correct. And I, and I'll tell you. So you know because of the water treatment history, a lot of plants were large in area, but use didn't use the area calculation. So it could have been F one, F two, or F three, but it wasn't thousands of square feet or square meters driving the occupancy. It was per design load. And oftentimes it was two or three people that would ever occupy the space. But even if it was one, we needed a barrier free unisex bathroom because we were under 10 and that had to be strategically located in the plant itself. So that was usually the norm for these post disaster buildings that 80% of the time have zero people, full automation, 20% of the time, one or two people. Mm -hmm. Oh, but then I was talking about industrial occupancies like. Like factories and stuff. Fair enough. But even those, they could, depending again, back, looking back to BIM and automation, and then you're introducing AI, etc. the actual number of occupants that have to be physically present could depend on the nature of the automation of the process or of the part that's running the industry. Okay, so you're aware of ISO 19650, right? Yes, the BIM, the ISO BIM standard. Yes, the ISO BIM standards. Okay, do you know how many parts it has? And you can just tell me if what contains in any one of the parts. 
I, I do not remember offhand how many parts. Um, it probably follows an ISO standard. I do know that one of them, uh, and this is from my history through the London Olympics, the heavy focus on what it means to collaborate. So the definition of WIP shared and published and how that weaves into information sharing. So in my past, so this would be a British standard 1192, Precursor to that on the London Olympics, we were working with the what was called the Avanti standard that governed WIP shared published archive. WIP being when you make the stuff, share how you want to share it, publishing a record of a deliverable, and then archiving for future use. That wove into BS 1192, which then bled into the ISO standard. So I'm passionate about that. And when I teach, I have a like whole uh, week course, like one of my weeks, the whole discussion is on collaboration and what it means for WIP shared and published. Because when we circle back to the application of the BIM process in any firm, so imagine a small firm, right? You're five people, you're starting this endeavor. The first question is going to be, how do I share my model with my consultant and vice versa? How do I share my model with my client and vice versa for information they have? maybe a laser scan or whatever. And this sharing of active information is a huge piece that the ISO standard touches upon and the predecessors all touched upon. And it's foundational to the world we live in now, which is a digital economy and a sharing of information. Awesome. So I'm going to give you the answer for that, the short answer for that. <laughs> and that's, um, it has total five parts. I'm not going to go into the detail what each part has, but the first part says uh, it outlines the concepts and principles of uh, how to manage building information. Right. Okay. Uh, but there is also a part zero to which, which is transition from BS 1192 to ISO 19650. So there is a transition part to yep. it. And, and, and that was critical because BS 1192, I think, was was standardized in the UK, I want to say for about seven, eight years now since yes. the first module came out. Right. So ensuring that they had that transitional buy-in was critical to validate the ISO standard. Okay, yeah, that is new piece of information for me. Okay, since you're so passionate about data and how data binds into our infrastructure and our building, I'm going to ask you my next question. What are the seven steps of data management life cycle? Oh, um, yes. okay, okay, so me, I'm going to, I'm going to, give me four. I, no, 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 I don't have the steps, but I'm going to flip this answer here. So, okay. and, and the, the reason, yeah. And the reason why is I think I've seen this with, so internally to Turner Fleischer, we have a knowledge manager. So we've actually defined knowledge, knowledge management as a critical piece of our, um, of our digital practice. So it's very rewarding and it's about, you know, what are those phases of, of information, awareness, understanding, how to apply it, how to uh, uh, we normalize it, archive it, et cetera, and to have a continuing cycle. And if I've hit any of them that are on what you've researched, rock on. But for me, even in building, so from BIM, building data or civil data, right? It's always think horizontal, horizontal and vertical infrastructure, it's always the same thing. How do you collect the data, design something, refine it, apply it, uh, preserve it, archive it, and it's always a cycle. I'm, so I, I'm a happy girl. You, you, deserve, you deserve a gift basket because you didn't answer it the in the steps, but you, you covered it. So it's data capture, data maintenance, data synthesis, usage, publication, archive, and purge. So the last one is, what is the name of the software from Bentley that deals with asset lifecycle information management? So um, asset-wise, at one point it was called that. Is that okay? No, and the reason I say that, and, and, and now I'm gonna expand on this, some of the challenge with the software vendors, whether it's Graphisoft, Bentley, Autodesk, or whomever, is branding. And so Bentley, for example, I, I cringed with AssetWise. It was once called ProjectWise Lifecycle Management. Um, Bentley's building application was Triforma, then Ecosim, now Open Buildings. 
And then Autodesk, when you look at BIM 360, this is their platform for sharing. It was A360, then it was BIM 360 Teams, then it was BIM 360 Next Gen. And now it's becoming BIM 360 Construction cloud. Platform Cloud. Construction. Yeah, Construction Cloud. Yeah. And it's just, oh my goodness, we've got to stop changing the names because when we talk to firms and say, you can do this BIM, software is a part of it not having continuity of understanding, we'll all stumble in the industry on making sure we have a common uh, framework for which to do projects. So yeah. the, the branding is very difficult at times. Yeah, Autodesk started with C4R collaboration forever. C4R, I forgot about that, yes. <laughs> that was what they were calling it, yes. Yes, so uh, yeah, because I think back then it was just for Revit and now they're just including anything and everything on the cloud platform. Yeah, yeah the Bentley one, they have few for asset management. So there's one for asset management, um, life cycle management, and then there are a few others. I forgot that too, although I looked it up last night. I still forgot it. Uh, but this That's is called asset wise, <laughs> asset wise Alim, A-L-I-M. But hmm. it's the same. There you go. Awesome. So I got one question. <laughs> you qualify for a gift basket. I, I love it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Amazing. It was so much fun talking to you, Brent. I am so happy you were here. And um, yeah, look forward for another chat, some other episode. Absolutely. I will be honored to come back and do this again whenever you'll have me.